So Brenton Caffin is uh, our next guest. He's um, uh, I'm broadly describing him as a public sector innovator. And there's some lovely things. Hello, Brenton. Oh. <laughs> nice to see you. And um, currently, he's the Executive Director of States of Change, which works with governments around the world to build the next generation or regeneration of, of public innovation. And I'm interested, uh, Brenton, to know a bit about what that means. Um, and I've known Brenton for some time, and um, he's worked around the relationship between government, communities, the people uh, on the fringes, people who are having difficulty navigating life or, or uh, being left out for, for one reason or another. So there are all sorts of structures, structures, cultural, political and, and so forth that um, give, need to, um, give rise to the need for, for innovation. Uh, so uh, you've also been working with a, with a global organisation called Nesta and um, States of Change is, is connected with that. And uh, those of us who are familiar with Nesta might be interested to know um, around the Australian context. But... Um, Brenton, I know you want to return to your provocation a bit later in, in your talk, but um, love to hear a bit from you around um, around unlearning with futures and um, where, where you're seeing things right now. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for having me and thanks. Uh, it's really exciting to be part of this, this conversation. Um, I, I did the obvious thing when you gave me the, uh, the framing of discombobulation and, and actually <laughs> went back to make sure I understand what it means by looking at a dictionary definition and I thought it'd be quite helpful maybe to share that just to kind of give us a little bit of a, a sort of grounding point and so um, I quite liked this uh, there was this dual definition of to discombobulate means to be to cause to be confused emotionally or to cause to be able unable to think clearly and I think we're actually kind of feeling a little bit of both of those at the moment um, this is a very emotional com emotionally confusing time um, and it's also a time when it can be very difficult to really sort of think clearly about the, the, the sort of ramifications of, of what we're going through. So I think for me, I think the first thing is just to acknowledge that these are very strange times um, and in a way to, to show up as people first rather than as, um, you know, professionals or experts. We are all people just trying to go through probably the single, you know, biggest uh, global transition um, that we will probably or well, that we've been through in our lifetimes um, we'll see what happens whether we've got further transitions to go through um, and so in a way that emotional journey um, is something that we need to acknowledge um, you know I've at different times you know sort of I've been reflecting on sort of the Kubler-Ross stages of grief um, journey you know denial anger depression bargaining and acceptance you know we're, we're sort of often feeling all of these emotions, often in the same day, um, often at different speeds, and we're often sort of, you know, sort of, sort of cycling forward and backwards through all of those. Um, we need to notice these feelings. We need to acknowledge them, but not be owned by them. Um, I saw a great uh, TED talk, TEDx talk. It was an impromptu one uh, run last week by Susan David uh, talking about how to manage through these times. And there's lots of great things in there, but one of them was to say, look, we are not our emotions. You know, we can acknowledge our emotions, we can sort of observe them, but we don't have to be captured by them. So I think part of, you know, it's, it's not trying to, do, to suppress them, but it's acknowledging them and then working through that. So for me, you know, personal journey, uh, you know, the last few weeks, I've had to make sure my family's safe, my kids, my parents, I've started homeschooling a couple of weeks ago, been checking in on friends around the world. Um, obviously, we've been sort of trying to um, work out what this means for, for states of change, which, you know, we spun out of Nesta three months ago. So we had a lot of assumptions about what our year was going to look like, and they've been turned upside down and making sure our team uh, are safe uh, and supported, making sure our community of practice um, and our networks around the world are uh, uh, supporting one another, and so that's been the the role that we've we've chosen to um, to adopt uh, to sort of be there and how we want to show up in this moment. But you're right, so, you're right there yeah. around the um, you know you, you you planned your calendar and you had the events or the or the or the professional goals. Certainly, I know that that's the sort of same same for us at Mod of of things that we had planned to achieve and to do and. You know, some of those have been put on hold, but some of those have have disappeared and won't and won't be happening. And and there is yeah. there is emotional grief around yeah. sort of saying goodbye to the future that you thought you were going to have. You know, just in this year alone, let alone what comes next. I think that's absolutely a nice thing to bring up. 
and and also just recognizing that um, it may not be obvious what the next thing to do is. At some point, you might just actually need to pause and just allow the situation to unfold, to emerge, you know, to observe, to reflect, to give yourself space. You know, there's been a lot of lot of stuff online about how to be super productive in this remote working world and how to fill all this time with all these moots that you were planning to do. And and actually, you know, it might be that we just need to sort of do a little bit less for a moment and and listen and watch and observe um, and, and and allow sort of that 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 voice to emerge. So I guess for me is you know we we you know we are you know uh, having to absorb quite a lot of stress. You know there, there's stress on our systems. There's stress on our institutions. Uh, there are stress on our beliefs that we hold, our relationships, you know, personal and professional. Um, but the one I wanted to really sort of emphasize is just um, we're stressing, stress testing our assumptions. You know, so if we go back to discombobulation, one of the ways we're being confused is that we're living through this moment where many of our deepest held assumptions uh, have been destroyed or made redundant or challenged in ways that we hadn't anticipated before. And so in a way, we kind of have to have the courage and the candor to kind of admit that, frankly, and to step forward through that uncertainty that, that follows, which, which does lead me to that provocation that I put up there, which um, yeah. was from uh, Anand from uh, The Times, I think, in New York, which is, you know, what's one thing that you have completely reversed your opinion on as a result of the crisis? Because it's very easy to look at the crisis and have it reinforce all your pre-existing beliefs. It takes a little bit more courage to kind of go, you know what, I thought this one thing and this has actually proven that actually something else holds. Uh, For me, it's been the speed and scale of government response. You know, this is my bread and butter. Uh, If you told me six months ago that, you know, that the uh, the current national government in Australia would drop $130 billion in six months um, and, you know, and bankroll 60% of the labour force, I would have, I would have asked you what you were smoking. Um, you know, we, we're in different times um, and, you know, and I, I guess I've been pleasantly surprised uh, and made hopeful by the, the fact that ideology hasn't, um, you know, um, blinded people to some solutions that need to be adopted. Yeah. And Brenton, um, uh, given that you put forward this um, provocation, which has appeared in the chat stream for those of you um, responding to this yourselves, and I know Kristen's um, uh, keeping an eye on that as well. Um, so you you indicated that uh, you know this uh, assumption you might have about our federal government in Australia, and I know the people from elsewhere watching this. Um, so is that something that you have reversed your opinion? An opinion reversal is quite a quite a strong thing. Is there something that's emerged for you yet uh, in your in your work potentially? Um, well, I, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, we, we've seen a situation, um, you know, in the last uh, 10 years of a hardening of political positions um, and, you know, whether it be sort of um, either sort of on one hand culture wars or on the other hand sort of, you know, uh, sort of, uh, economic um, ideology uh, in, in, in sort of political discourse uh, sort of hardening and polarising. And, you know, and if you'd asked me whether that was going to go away, uh, or whether it would dissolve as rapidly as it had, I would tell you, I, I would have found that very, very hard to believe. Um, it may only be temporary, and I want to come to this, but but like it, it may only be temporary, but it gives us, I think, um, an opportunity to imagine what it might be like when we get through this particular period, how we might be able to draw on some of that muscle memory that, of bipartisanship and of, and of, of you know, pragmatism uh, for for a different age, um, you know, I, I love people starting to use the language of flattening the curve and saying, "Well, how do we flatten the curve on climate change?" Because we, we now have a meme that people have wrapped their heads around, and we and they recognise the, um, I guess, perhaps the, uh, the degree of change in lifestyle that may be required to achieve a sort of common goal. And they've also started, certainly in Australia in the last few days, we've, we've started to see some signs of progress on that front. Um, I wonder whether that gives us confidence um, of, of a sense of agency that we can actually apply this to other policy goals. Um, I think the, the rapid, ad- uh, I guess, adoption of... of um I'm just reminded that we went through uh, a walk through the Adelaide Parklands yesterday and there was one family per park. 
you know, almost perfect <laughs> one family per part. Yep. Um, and I mean, that's that's something that I'm astonished by that we've we've people have kind of taken on board the science, which they, you know, we, we were having enormous struggles with people taking on, on recommendations from science for policy previously. Yeah. They, they've changed what they're doing. They're, they're being really observant, or we are all being really observant about that quite quite quickly. Um, and I think there, there, is, there is some excitement that comes from that. You know, if we can do that, maybe there are other things that we can do. So someone on YouTube's just said, you know, I'm experiencing a mix of grief and uncertainty. Which I, you know, which it, which rings true, along with the excitement about pivoting and adapting, and I think that's that confusion of, of feeling. Somebody else had said, you know, it's really it's really good, Brenton, that you're acknowledging the emotional impact of it, because all of those feelings all at once are are incredibly exhausting, um, yeah. and trying to notice them and articulate exactly how we're feeling is 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 really difficult. Yeah, but I think that rapid that rapid change for people in 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 adopting new practices and new behaviours so quickly is really really interesting. Yeah. And maybe I'll, I'll drop in sort of two two more concepts which might be helpful for across the the conversations we're going to have. I mean, one you know is from political science is this notion of the Overton window, is this kind of idea about and if you haven't heard of it, you know the Overton window is named after a political scientist who basically said. For any given policy area, there's a there's a range of policies that are deemed acceptable to public acceptance, and basically, you know, irrespective of what the politician believes, this is the range that they can actually prosecute at any point in time. Um, I think what we've seen in this moment is that that window has just expanded massively. As I say, if anyone had said six months ago that any government would drop 130 billion dollars in six months and would be able to get the bulk of the population to voluntarily you know, physically distance, yeah. right? You know, that would have not been something that we would have anticipated would have been achievable, and yet we've done it. So the interesting question for me is, what can, you know, this Overton window is, is a, it is a choice that we accept of what is deemed to be acceptable, and that is challengeable, that is, that's contestable, and I think we should contest it. Um, the second, the second thing I wanted to drop in quickly is um, something I, I read a few years ago from Yuval Harari in Sapiens, um, and in his book about you know the, the sort of the, um, the evolution of, of, of human civilization, uh, and one of the ways he he describes it is this ability for us to be able to create what he calls intersubjective fiction, which is something which is basically saying we make stuff up, and as long as you believe it and I believe it, it's real. So nation states don't actually really exist, but we basically have some conventions by which we pretend they do. You know, currencies don't actually exist. They're just pieces of paper. But you and I will agree that there's some value attached to this piece of paper or some ones and zeros in our bank account. And we can do things with that as long as we all believe those. Now, we, we, we tend to think these, these intersubjective fictions are immutable and they've been there for and ever and ever. But actually, when you, when you dig into the history of them, Many of them are only a few generations old, uh, and some of them have shifted massively. If you'd asked somebody 30 years ago what marriage meant, you'd get a very different answer today than you would 30 years ago. Um, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the acceptance around same-sex marriage you know, in the last 10 years, five years even, in many, many countries around the world demonstrates just how fluid these, these uh, intersubjective fictions can be if we have a conversation about evolving them. So I guess... The thing I'm really optimistic about or hopeful about is what new intersubjective fictions will we need to or can we create to help us get through what comes next? Do we have the imagination to bring them into being? And what, what does that speak for leadership? So I know, Kristen, you wanted to sort of say, what, you know, what kind of leadership do we need? I think we need a leadership that's, that's humble, you know, that's, that's curious, that's imaginative and that's experimental. So not dogmatic, but seeking out and testing and bringing people with you on a journey. Yeah, that's look, that's really interesting because um, Faith Coleman's just posted a note saying, I thought Australians would struggle to do what the government had asked them to do, to take individual responsibility and adapt to the new social restrictions. But what she's commenting on is that, you know, we're seeing society actually leading the government and kind of going, but should we be doing more? What, what should we be doing? Um, and the, that's that's a beautiful thing and, and, and really inspiring. But... But, and I find imagination the same, you know, in terms of, you know, if, if we can if we can lead on that front, how do how do we how do we create space for people to, you know, maybe to slow down and imagine, to create those those new fictions, as you say, Brenton, um, and lead lead what we want. 
um, our, gov our government to be to be representing us to do, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an interesting question also. Yeah, it's a great point. Where does leadership start? You know, do we need, you know, capital L leaders to lead or is the public actually leading us? You know, who moved the Overton window? Was it was it the federal government or was it people saying we really need to do more, which made it easier for the politicians to step into that into that sort of uh, that gap that was created by by sort of you know public leadership. I um I must say I'm feeling uh, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm feeling quite excited by the fact that you've you've talked about a window that's superimposed over a, a graph that represents public opinion, and we're we're getting very familiar with these sorts of graphs, and and that's become part of our daily language. Um, so I. I I just wanted um, one last uh, question, Brenton, um, unless there's something you wanted to pop in from um, the chat, Kristen. No, um, I was thinking oh, look, about. The only, yeah, sorry, Matthew. The only thing that's that's yeah. coming up is this. Um, just just a comment around the, you know, someone said, you know, for, for them, they're finding the physical distancing getting incre increasingly difficult, and so there there's, there is also this moment of of us responding to crisis and doing what's required in the in the short term but also maintaining something in the longer term. And so, you know, while that question is one around, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we do this over the longer term, I think underneath that question is that even bigger question, which is what kind of behaviours do we want to sustain um, and what kind of leadership is required then to sustain something in the longer term versus this short-term disc discombobulation and, and rapid, rapid adjustment. So that might be something that we can, we can explore, you know, further in the dismantling the discovery phases as well. Great. Um, well, look, um, I'd like to thank you very much, Brenton, uh, for for being with us here. And I know you're going to stick around. Um, I'm sure you'll be interested to see what what emerges from this. So, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Pleasure. Um, look forward to hearing the rest of the conversation. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and look, um, as um, as we go through this as well, um, uh, the presenters will will mention particular resources. Um, so, for instance, uh, Brenton mentioned a TEDx talk. Um, and we'll be asking uh, presenters and anything that Kristen and I might might talk about to just share those links um, as we package this up, um, this live event, which will then live on <laughs> um, as part of the Life Interrupted exhibition. So there'll be um, that there as well. So, and of course, feel free to share um, in the chat stream your own resources and so forth, and we can consider that part of it. Yeah, so I might, uh, I might just mention quickly then, Matthew, mm. that um, you know that this this event, Futures Unlearned, is is part of um, a broader thing that we're doing at Mod called Life Interrupted, mm. which is an online exhibition that we 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 got up in eight days <laughs> yeah. um, to to allow us to still meet the mission of what Mod wants to do, which is is to inspire young adults, but but to help them feel like there's a place where they belong, and also to help people generally feel like they can navigate the future. Um, and then there are options available to them. And so having this kind of discussion within that context of, of, a, of a broader online exhibition is, is, is really exciting, I think. So, so, yeah, I'd urge people to check out the rest of the exhibition as, as well as this, as this talk when they get a chance. Yes, don't go there yet. Don't go there yet. <laughs> um, but uh, but it, is, um, it is great. There's uh, a whole range of different things that have been put together. And I actually got to observe the mob team scrambling and putting this together and learning all the way through and unlearning the ways that um, things were done with a physical exhibition. So, yeah, it's, um, it's really worth um, exploring when you have the time.